Hello, I'm John Nichols and I'm a retired GP. So I spend my time doing research and writing since I stopped seeing patients. And I'd like to talk to you about the discovery of the first vitamin, which is quite a story. So just going to share my screen. So how was the first vitamin discovered? As I say, it's quite a story. And it starts with 1884, when the miasma theory of disease is finally dead and buried. This was a theory of disease which had held sway for hundreds of years, it was based on the idea that all disease was caused by bad smells emanating from marshes, cesspits, uh, rotting bodies, etc. It was uh, a theory which you could see uh, applied quite well to life in the Middle Ages. But by this time in the 19th century, it was beginning to get a bit rocky. And this was a paradigm shift, and call it paradigm shift number one the germ theory of disease was established with the help of Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch in particular. They discovered that uh, wound infections, tuberculosis, cholera were all due to germs. And Koch's postulates his four rules of proving that you had found a disease caused by germs are these four postulates here. But most important of all is this one, the specific disease must be reproduced when a pure culture of the bacteria is inoculated into a healthy, susceptible host. And by a susceptible host, it almost certainly meant uh, an animal model of some sort, because you didn't want to take big risk with human volunteers. So what do I mean by a paradigm shift. Well, this was spelled out by the American physicist Thomas Kuhn in 1962 in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. For hundreds of years, normal science uh, chugs along. And in this case, it's the miasma theory of disease. It seems to fit the bill. There are pre-science ideas, rather fringe ideas, that uh, there may be uh, tiny little cre invisible creatures hovering in the air that cause disease. And most serious doctors and scientists dismiss this as um, like believing in ghosts and uh, superstition. So this was dismissed as pure superstition and the miasma theory, as I say, carried on for hundreds of years. But by the 19th century, the miasma theory was beginning to get a bit shaky as what's called model drift. And some of these pre-science ideas were filtering in. And then the microscope was invented and you could see these tiny little creatures that were invisible to the naked eye. And this caused a model crisis. The miasma theory, still believed by many people, became even more shaky followed by a model revolution and a paradigm change to a new paradigm, which is the germ theory of disease. So you have a complete paradigm shift. It takes time, but we've got there. Now, another paradigm shift, and this is where the first vitamin is discovered. So I had to give you the background because Christian Eichmann was a, a Dutch military doctor who uh, was part of the race to find the germ that causes beriberi. He believed it was a germ. Nearly everybody else believed it was a germ. Some people said, no, no, it's something to do with nutrition, but it was all rather vague. And this germ theory of disease was what now held sway, you see. So he was sent to uh, a military 
colony, Dutch colony in Sumatra. It's a military hospital with soldiers dying of beriberi. Beriberi is a very unpleasant disease. Um, you get muscle wasting, lassitude, and then your lower limbs start to swell up, your legs swell up, and you get breathless, and you go into heart failure, and your lips go blue, and then you die. He found a good animal model. And this was the susceptible host was the hen. Uh, it was easy to keep the hens and he took blood from patients dying of beriberi, which he thought must be rich in the beriberi germ or bacterium and injected them into hens. And the hens did develop beriberi, but it seemed to be irrespective of whether they'd been injected or not. So he was trying to puzzle this out for about a year when suddenly in 1889, all the hens got better and he couldn't understand why. So he talked to his hen keeper and said, you must have some idea what's changed in, in our hens to make them suddenly all get better. This is, this is a clue out that it, it, it's gotta be very important. And the hen keepers, who was a local man, said, well, I'm sorry, boss, I, I think it must be my fault because for the last uh, two years, I've been feeding our hens with white rice left over from the kitchen at the military hospital over the road. And recently, uh, a, a new cook was appointed who wouldn't go along with it. It's quite um, good for me, money-wise, it worked very nicely, but the new cook said he wasn't going to give white rice from the military kitchen to our civilian hens. And that was the end of that arrangement. So I had to put them back on the bog standard brown rice. And this of course was the clue because there's something in brown rice, which during the process of polishing rice to make it into white rice has been removed. And Eichmann did several experiments to show that this was the case. He really nailed it. But then he developed malaria and had to go home to the Netherlands and other researchers came after him who continued experiments to find out more about beriberi and its nutritional component. Eichmann was convinced that there was still a beriberi germ of some sort and that this uh, nutritional, vital nutritional component helped the chickens to fight that germ or helped humans with beriberi to fight the germ. And Williams from a scientist from America uh, carried on doing research on this for many years and produced many miraculous cures. So what came next in this, to me, fascinating story? Well, first of all, I should say uh, the moral of the story so far is never give your chickens white rice when healthy round, brown rice is available. Uh, the, this chicken is looking rather suspiciously at a, a bowl of white rice that has been offered to it and quite right too. So the next interesting person was Casimir Funk. Uh, he was a Polish scientist, but he was working at the List Institute in London and incidentally, he uh, reproduced uh, Eichmann's research by doing similar research on London pigeons, who he uh, um, used uh, an extract of the polishings of brown rice uh, to do this research on the pigeons to show that that was essential to life. And when he managed to uh, extract and analyze a chemical from the polishings, he noticed that there was an amine group on it, which he thought was quite important. It wasn't amino acid, but it contained an amine, an NH3. So it's got a nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms on it, on a large molecule, which was the essential vital factor. So he said, this is a vital amine. And in a paper, he was asked to write for a leading medical journal, he described it as a vital amine. And this quite quickly got shortened to vitamin, which we all know about vitamins. So it's in effect, Casimir Funk 
who invented the word vitamin. He also, by the way, is a very clever guy. He predicted that scurvy, rickets, and pellagra would very soon be found to be due to vitamin deficiencies and the medical cures for these conditions would soon be easily uh, determined. Well, the outcome of this paradigm shift to the new theory of disease caused by nutritional deficiency um, was that not all disease is caused by germs. Diseases can be caused by nutritional factors as well. So this was like a second paradigm shift. And the two do overlap, for instance, in this coronavirus epidemic, we have seen that people who have a poor nutritional status and are lacking vitamins and minerals are more likely to die from coronavirus. You'll be glad to hear, I'm sure, that Christian Eichmann survived his malaria and lived to an old age. As you can see here, he is a lot older. And he received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1929. But what about Casimir Funk? Here he is again, a lot older, and happily working in his laboratory in America now. And he, he's a happy man. You can see uh, the look on his face. But I'm afraid to say, although he was nominated for a Nobel Prize four times, he never received this award, which I think he definitely deserved. Now, if you want to hear more stories like this, um, go to my website and learn about my book, An Introduction to Nutritional Medicine, where Darwin meets Hippocrates. Oh, you can see Darwin and Hippocrates shaking hands there before they start their picnic. They meet on a, a, a grassy hillside in what seems a bit like heaven to them, but it's not quite right for heaven. It's a bit odd. So if you want to learn more about Darwin and Hippocrates, that's also in the book. And you also learn the story of vitamin C, which started in ancient Egypt with onions but also involved experiments on conscientious objectors in World War I. And you'll also learn about trans fatty acids. And they were used as a branded cooking fat called Crisco from, in America from 1911. And it wasn't until 1993 that the harmful effects of trans fatty acids in, in cooking and industrial production of food was fully recognized, a major cause of diseases, heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. So um, if you want to buy my book, uh, please go to my website and you'll find many more stories like this. And for, for now, I have to say goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.